Okay? We have two speakers for you here today. Uh, we have Juniper Draya, who is standing in front of you. Juniper was born in Chicago, Illinois, and was raised there, also in San Diego, California, and Quito, Ecuador. Uh, after receiving her Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Cornell, she worked as a ride and show engineer building Universal Studio and Warner Brothers theme parks in Los Angeles, Japan, and Spain up till about 2001. Afterwards, she worked for NASA Dryden in uh, flight operations before earning her Master's of Science degree in aerospace engineering. Uh, at which point she was specializing in uh, bioastronautics, and she earned that at the University of Colorado, Boulder, in 2004. From 2005 to 2008, Juniper worked as a NASA graduate co-op student uh, at JSC here, sorry. Uh, one moment. where she can also continued her graduate uh, studies with an emphasis on integrating physiology at UCLA. And she worked as an employee of several commercial space flight companies, Blue Origin, XPRIZE, SpaceX, Andrew Space, and Zero Gravity Corporation. In 2008, she returned to JSC with Jacobs Technology, working for Crew and Thermal Systems Division, and has been a project engineer and a test engineer on the EVA development and verification test team where she continues to work today. We have a second speaker <coughs> today, uh, Robert Durkin. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, Robert is a product of Harrington, Kansas, and he received his Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from Wichita State University. He started his civil servant career with NASA in 1993 over at the WETF. So, he was also, he moved over from the WETF and went to the neutral buoyancy facility in 1997, helped to develop the breathing gas system, and was the flight lead for STS-88, which was the first uh, crew to be trained over in the NBL. He then moved on to the engineering directorate, working for EM as the lead for the mock-up development area, and then he went on to work as a subsystem manager for the shuttle landing systems. In 2002, he returned to the NBL as a uh, facility manager, where he continued to take jobs of higher responsibility in the facility. He became chief of the engine of the NBL in 2010. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Juniper. Thank you, Bill. Provide the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Robert, for coming. Uh, my name is Juniper Gerala, and I'll be presenting on EVA development and verification testing at the Voice Laboratory. And I want to start by saying I, I owe a lot of what is going to be presented here to the help of my co-authors. Um, this presentation is largely based on a, another presentation that was given at a recent conference and on an AIAA paper that I co-authored with Robert Durkin, Ralph Marek, Angie Prince, Stephanie Sipola. Scott Perzinski, Art Thomason, and Zane Nye. So thank you to all of them, and a couple of them are here too. So to start, I wanted to share this topic and uh, write this paper and present this for a few reasons. First of all, to increase awareness about the MBL here at the center and in the, and, and in the community and the, the industry in general. I also wanted to share how we do MBL testing and development, development testing and why we do it and also share ideas on how maybe we could use the NBL for future uses or external uses. And Robert's going to go into that towards the end. So I'm going to go through several topics. I'm going to talk about the background of the NBL, which probably most of you know, but this is being recorded. So who knows who will see it? And actually, that's probably the scariest part. But anyway, um, I'll talk about the philosophy of the testing that we do. Uh, the, the setup and how the facility is uh, configured for our testing. I'll talk about um, how we go through and plan each of these tests and what all the roles and responsibilities are, who's, who the players are. Then uh, talk about mock-ups and how we develop hardware for these tests to meet our objectives. I'll go over a typical day um, of development testing 
And I'll go over some of the challenges that we've had and some of the real successes we've had by doing development testing at the MBL. And then um, some of the, see this is mostly based on ISS testing, of course, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some other non-ISS related testing that we've done. And then Robert will talk about external and future uses of the MBL, and um, then they'll do some acknowledgments. So, as we all know, it's a large indoor pool, 202 feet long by 102 feet wide and 40 feet deep, used for primarily EVA training here at J Johnson Space Center. It was built in 1996 to help us build the space station. And over that time, we've done 126 EVAs and about 840 sortie hours solely to build the space station. Lots of time in space. And it's large enough to accommodate all of the space station components, uh, the, the, the whole truss complement, the uh, ISS elements, uh, the international segments, the airlock, all the pallets, HDV4, and up until recently, the shuttle payload bay. I love this picture. This is one of the Express Logistics carrier pallets and uh, one of the truss segments. The rest of the truss segment is over here. Of course, we know it's not big enough to accommodate the whole space station in its full configuration, but we get a good chunk of it all in one piece. Um, at its peak, we were doing uh, two simultaneous activities in the MBL, up to five suited subjects at a time. Uh, we have the 46% um, oxygen, giving our subjects up to 400 minutes, or 6.7 hours of, of underwater time, which is similar to what a EVA duration is. And it's also been a very important tool for us in developing hardware for the space station and other NASA programs. Over the time that we've been doing development testing in the MBL, which not me the whole time because this has gone on for years and years, uh, we've looked at over a thousand issues related to uh, hardware development and also spent about 1,700 underwater hours to do that. So a lot of development testing and that's aside from all the training that's gone on. Now, why philosophy? I'm going to say why we do, why we use the MBL for development testing, and why it's used for training. Of course, there are other alternatives that Johnson Space Center has, like parabolic flights, where you get that perfect reduced gravity or microgravity time, but it's only about 30 seconds, and also it's very expensive and complex to set up. The nice thing is you don't have the issues of water drag; you don't have the issues of water at all. Uh, the thermal and vacuum chambers, which are great for perfectly mimicking the space environment, the, the thermal conditions, the vacuum conditions, we get that, but we don't get, uh, we don't get the full-blown setup. And we can't exactly have an astronaut walk around in a thermal chamber in a suit. It's a lot more limited. But we can evaluate hardware exactly in flight configuration and see how it behaves in the environment. We also have the POGO and the ARGOS, the partial offload gravity system and the, uh, yeah, forget the acronyms. Anyway, these things can raise a person up, offset their weight for a certain amount, and give them the feeling that they would feel if they're walking in one-sixth or one, or one-third gravity, put them on treadmills, have them do tasks like shovel rocks or, or uh, move heavy objects, to give them a sense of what it would be like to perform in that limited uh, gravity, but you've got that cumbersome object that's being used to hold them up behind them, and also very limiting. And we now have Argos that gives you X and Y for movement, but we still don't, we don't have Z quite <laughs> that way we have it in the MBL. And then virtual reality, all these things come together to help astronauts train for EVA. Virtual reality gives them uh, the real visual of what they'd be seeing in space. And also with the Charlotte system, we can give them an exact feeling of what it'd be like to move a 600 pound uh, piece of hardware or orbital replacement unit. They can feel it and they can see it exactly where their hands would be placed and what kind of body, what kind of inertia they'd have to overcome to move an object. But that's it, that's pretty limited. So we come to the MBL and we get all those things combined with some limitations, of course, like the drag. And we can look at things happening in 3D. We can 
look at moving this large ORU, which is probably about, I think, this is the pump module. I'll, it's about 600 pounds in space. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we can put an astronaut in a, in a foot restraint, another one in another foot restraint, and this person on the truss segment, and this person on the pallet, and we can look at whether these two guys can accomplish removing the ORU from the pallet and handing it over. So as we basically, this person is doing all the work of removing it from the pallet and has to figure out how to arrange his hands and arms and whether there are handholds on, on the ORU that are, allow him to do that um, and allow him to remove it from the interface on the pallet and if he would have the strength and the, the uh, body positioning to be able to hand it over to another crew member that's on the truss. Things like this we're able to do in the MBL and figure out if it can be done without the arm, for example, uh, whether there would be a two-person task. Uh, all the things we look at are whether equipment can be translated with, whether it's designed with enough tether points and handrail locations, whether we have the clearances to do um, to get tools inside to do what we need to do, even to get the, that ORU off the pallet, is there tool clearance to achieve that? Um, whether tasks need to be done with a foot restraint or whether they can be done free float, some, uh, some pistol grip tool, PGT torques, are a little more than one could handle in free float or with a body restraint tether, so they have to be done with a foot restraint. Uh, we look at whether tasks uh, can be accomplished with one crew member or two, or need, whether a task um, needs to be two-handed task or single-handed task. Uh, recently, we have looked at um, tools to repair sharp edges on the space station, and the one requirement that, we're, that they were, the designers were hoping to achieve was that this be a one-handed task, so that crews can be holding on to a handrail on the space station and be scraping with the tool with the other. Um, now, if this tool had not been designed such that you could do anything with it with only one hand, then of course it would have to be redesigned or this would be named a two-handed task. So we evaluate things like that also. We evaluate where crew members will have to position their bodies for certain tasks. We look at reach, whether they have reach to, in the suit, as we all know is very limiting, uh, cumbersome, heavy, and whether there will be um, arm assistance needed for a task. And as I mentioned, there are, there have all we know, 126 EVAs so far to build, in total, to build a space station. And they're most, the most complex that have been performed in human spaceflight history, all with the help of the MBL. We've also used it for hardware certification. Say, for example, um, an analysis uh, determines that a task is not achievable in the suit because there are uh, standards that need to be met of clearance of, um, of work envelope. These are put into a large CAD system and evaluated with, with the hardware. And it's deemed that such a task is not possible because work envelope requirements are not met or tool clearance or glove clearance requirements are not met. But in reality, we know that humans are special and creative and can probably do a little bit better than a, than a computer calculates that they can. So we'll come to the MBL and we'll, meet a, we'll show that a requirement or a task can be met that analysis showed that it couldn't. So that's been very useful as well. Um, we'll accept hardware that's uh, by, uh, by evaluated in the MBL. We'll accept certain aspects of it. We'll um, sometimes close flight, har flight hardware requirements. Um, and why, like I said, analysis has to come up, has to use a lot of assumptions. The more assumptions you have, the more inaccurate your analysis is. So we come with real people into the MBL and we look at actual hardware and, and evaluate it. So there are several phases that in development testing can be done. We've done it in pre-PDR or the requirements phase when hardware designers are just writing the requirements for the hardware. They're just coming up with the broad concepts. Um, we'll, we'll use really low or medium fidelity mockups and we'll just look at whether requirements are even adequate. Uh, a recent example was uh, there was an idea to perhaps make the pump module modular so that if it broke, not the whole pump module will have to be removed from the truss and replaced. 
maybe we could develop something that had smaller pieces. And if one smaller piece was broken, then that would be removed and wouldn't have to do the whole thing. So we looked at whether a crew member could get inside the truss and actually have the clearance to remove something that might be built into the pump module, like a smaller box, and whether that was even possible. So that took tell us, well, at least we meet the requirement of being able to get inside the truss. The rest about designing the modular pump module is the next step, another phase. We've all, we also do between PDR and CDR testing, between preliminary design review and critical design review, and that's actually where most MBL testing occurs. We look at operability of the hardware in the integrated um, space station environment or future vehicle environment. We'll use more fidelity mockups, medium to high fidelity mockups, and we'll do more precise testing. We'll have objectives that are more, more exacting. We'll have more specific tasks that we need to show that we can accomplish with the hardware. And after CR is another phase that, MP, that development testing can occur. This will look at the operational timelines. Uh, we'll use really high fidelity mockups. And we'll look at integrating a single task that maybe we looked at during the PDR to CDR phase into a full-length EVA. Uh, and you know, sometimes when that happens, if we've, we've shown that a, a piece of hardware or design is adequate during PDR and CDR, it turns out to be not ideal once integrated into a full-length EVA. And that portion becomes more of the trainers and flight controllers job as opposed to engineering and development. Uh, testing, but but that's that's what we'll sometimes find out is that a minor redesign needs to occur once the full EVA is taken into account. Other tasks, the robotic arm, people, etc. This pi oh, <laughs> I just wanted to say this is a picture of you all know Scott doing the actually that's a picture of Scott too. He gave me all the pictures he had. <laughs> Credit Scott for the pictures. <laughs> um, another uh, important aspect of the test philosophy, so philosophy is crew selection. So all, all crew members are EVA qualified, of course, and they can all make valuable suggestions. But there are certain things we have to make sure we take into account when we're saying this hardware is operable, for example. Uh, one is anthropometrics. We want to make sure we're getting a good broad range represented in our tests of the tallest crew member with the longest arms that can reach, you name it, everywhere uh, and fix solar panels um, to the shorter crew members with shorter arms, um, uh, maybe different girths, etc. Uh, this, we, uh, when we're doing operable, operability testing, we're matching the work envelope um, to the work site, to the human, and some things will be critical. When we looked at ELCs, and there were, uh, there were the interfaces to release the ELC from the truss, uh, there were, strangely enough, the shorter crew members were more able to get to these, in these bolts than the taller crew members. The taller crew members were saying, I can't get it, I, you know, this is not doable. The shorter crew members were having an easier time of it. But there were other tasks in that same development series that were easier for the taller crew members. So it's important to look at everyone's uh, abilities. We look at the heights. We looked at range of arm lengths. We look at various skirts. The other thing is this, the skill and experience mix of a crew. Um, we've, we've seen that not all crew perform at the same level, and that's OK. Um, more skill and experience means you might get more accurate and thorough feedback. Uh, but then again, say for future when we have contingency maintenance to do on the ISS, something like a pump module just suddenly breaks and you've got who you got on board to fix it, we want to know that, we, that tasks, that objectives, that hardware is operable uh, by the decent broad range of astronauts that could be on the ISS at any one time when something happens. So this goes into our testing very important way. And to achieve a consensus on a piece of hardware, we need six astronauts. So that's how these are put together. And now the test setup for the facility. Um, as a lot of people here know, there are 
two high bays on either side of the MBL of the pool. That's for staging and maintenance of mock-ups. There are two. There are ten-ton overhead bridge cranes that allow us to move. I shouldn't say us. I should say MBL, but <laughs> allow the MBL to move mock-ups in and out of the water. Uh, there's underwater digital audio and video, so we can see everything that's going on, hear everything that's going on with breathing gas and um, cooling through the life support and vehicles to the spacesuits. And operational staff includes two safety divers, one utility diver, and one camera diver per subject per test. Then we have our suit engineers, our suit technicians, our subsystem operators, the people that operate the crane, the people that dry off the floor so we don't slip, etc. Now every test event or every test series for development testing is uh, consists of a four-hour scuba run. That's about a week before all the suited runs happen. This is where people like me get in the water with the astronauts and talk too much on the microphones, explain to them how to do, how, what the hardware looks like, what the test setup is, where are the interfaces are that they need to uh, worry about during the testing, and a general overview of everything that they're going to see once they're in a suit. It's, it's a fami familiarization run and also to get them to test out, test out some things they might want to be more uh, familiar with before getting the suit. Sometimes we'll uh, verify foot restraint settings so we don't waste time doing it in the suited runs. We'll do measurements on hardware, uh, especially if we're doing a verification on hardware. Uh, we'll check clearances between mock-ups to make sure that, that the con test configura configuration is flight-like and what we need to look at so that when we're testing, we're actually confident that we're representing what it would be like in space and we can say, yay, this is good. And then we have a six-hour engineering run, which is a suited run, typically with suited subjects, engineers, I mean, and we run through our procedures, every little detail, and make sure we have everything all ready to go before we take astronauts' time in the suit. Then we have three six-hour suited runs with astronauts and two crew per day, and we run them through those, all of those procedures. So I've added this back in. Um, I thought it might be useful for those who are looking to do some MBL development testing coming up. Uh, there's the mock-up hardware and development flow, how we get things, how we get hardware ready, ready for the MBL testing. Uh, that starts with a test conductor, which, which could be someone like me, or it could be someone from the training or flight control group, like Scott here, this Scott. Um, we'll say these are the tools and the objectives and the equipment interfaces that we want to look at in this test. And then from that from that list to determine what the hardware requirements are and then work with the flight lead at, at the MBL to discuss these requirements and check with the flight lead on whether the hardware that we need is available in the MBL. The flight lead will check in the inventory and let us know if it is there or not. This can be anything from a tool, a, a small itty bitty ORU. It can be a detail about, um, about a piece of hardware. It can be detail about how high fidelity it is, whether it is built up with the interfaces that we want to check with all the little bolts and springs and panels and everything. It, or they can come back to us and say, we have this hardware, but only a volumetric version of it. It just tells you how big it is and uh, maybe uh, g gives you the, the external uh, handrails that, are on, that would be on it but it doesn't give you all the little widgets that would have to be operated on. So if that's something we want in our test, we'll come back and say, then that needs to be built. <laughs> um, or, for example, does one of the external sources might have it, Boeing, Jacobs, Lockheed. If that's the case, test conductor will get it from Boeing and Lockheed with a long paperwork process and then bring it back to the NBL. If not, then the choice is to fabricate a new mock-up or fabricate modifications to a mock-up through which a change request is submitted either by DX or by the crew office, engineers in the CB or engineers in the EVA, EVA training office. And then the NVL develops the hardware and they use this document, the NVL mock-up and training hardware requirements, which detail how hardware needs to be built for specific use in the NBL. For example, whether it will be built out of, whether it will be flight-like, just functional, uh, operable, or just static, as I was mentioning before. 
uh, whether it's going to be more class three, class one, class two, class one um, category, how high fidelity it's going to be, basically. Um, we'll also look at uh, whether we have to use stainless steel for the hi-fi interfaces. Stainless steel has been used for mo nodes, for example, for the structure. Um, fiber reinforced plastic has been used for uh, the truss structures. Kydex is used for, the, for skins of large mock-ups. And ultra high molecular weight, UHMW, polyethylene for smaller mock-ups. And in for some tools like the PGT. Um, and some of these smaller boxes. This here is the no two heat exchangers. And as I was saying, sometimes we might just want to know whether a crew member can translate by a node to end cone. Or we want to know whether a crew member can remove a panel from the, from the end cone and actually remove um, a heat exchanger and replace it. This has to be built up so that this test can be achieved. And not every, uh, not every uh, heat exchanger in the pool might be represented to such a detail. Um, there are other features that, we, that the MBL uses to make hardware uh, behave appropriately, such as uh, large lightning holes like these to reduce drag in the water, and then embedding foam. You don't see it, but there's always pieces of foam in here to help it uh, float more, and also to weigh it out. Um, we, want to, we, want to, we want hardware to behave as neutrally buoyant as possible uh, in, as we can in all directions. And so for that, foam is added to little corners and things to help achieve that. Um, there's also a lot of trade-off that's done when all the negotiations that happen, when a change request is put in, we'll say, oh, at first, ask for everything, the full shebang, but there will be time limitations. MBL tests, uh, MBL development tests are often um, put together on shorter timelines than, say, uh, a training plan for a mission. So we'll have, instead of a year, we'll have maybe a couple months to get some piece of hardware built. So while we would like to have all the little details that would be on this piece of hardware um, for our test, sometimes that's just not humanly possible. So MBL comes back to us and says, can we give you this? Um, instead, can we fake it with this? And the test conductor and the, and the whole planning team decides what we can live with and what we can still, uh, what we can use to still meet our objectives. Everyone pretty much has a say in these kinds of things, from the principal investigator, uh, operations, crew office, engineering, you name it. So as I was starting to say, there are all these people that come into play to help put together a test. Um, and I'm um, also mentioning that it takes about two to four months for the planning to occur for a development test, typically. It starts with a, a principal investigator, um, who's also the test requester. And this can be a person from anywhere, um, XA, uh, the crew office, DX, a hardware provider like Boeing or Lockheed, someone from another center, um, someone that has money, <laughs> the Canadians, uh, you name it. Um, and there's the EVA office representative. That would be someone like Stephanie Sipala here, uh, who determines what the content of the test will be and prioritizes the objectives for it. Um, of course, with the whole team also contributing to that. Then will be a test engineer, an uh, EVA development and verification test team lead, such as I, or soon, Brian Burry. He's training for a test coming up. Um, doing the bulk of the test planning, uh, documentation, and coordination, and then ultimately being the test conductor. This is someone from um, EC7 or Jacobs. Uh, mission operations is also in, in the, the team, providing expertise on operations, um, mock-up requirements, writing those CCRs for us. <laughs> uh, crew office representative sometimes also submits CRs. Uh, selects the crew for the test, writes the crew consensus report at the end after all the six astronauts have said yay or nay on every uh, little task, and provides that crew perspective that unique to the crew, a little more than anyone else can provide. Um, know, they know more intricately what really a crew is going to be willing and able to do in space or might consider to be worthwhile or consider to be 
testable, et cetera. The flight lead from the MBL is also uh, very important to this. Coordinates the pool configuration, brings all the mock-ups to us by help of their people at the MBL. And this is someone from uh, DX12, Raytheon. And the project lead from the MBL, who is responsible for getting the hardware, uh, the mock-ups certified for testing, running it through all the, um, all the paperwork, the design reviews, the safety reviews, et cetera, also can design it and build it. Um, I wanted to show here the pictures from scuba runs, scuba runs, <laughs> uh, this engineering run. Actually, that's my soup call. Never mind. Um, okay, so more detail about the development and verification planning flow. This hopefully will be helpful to some people here. Um, as I mentioned, the team that goes into it and it starts with the customer, usually the EVA office, um, identifying a test request, and working with the principal investigator to assign um, the test, to request the test, then goes to the test conductor to start planning it, and it's assigned as someone to pl start planning it. And also we meet with the MBO um, long-range planning meeting to assign a time, a block of time, within the uh, whole EVA calendar to do these tests. And it's we usually because we want to be able to have uh, a, an uninterrupted block of time. Yeah, as I mentioned, we have a scuba run and then four suited runs, basically, and our setups are usually unique and special for the, for the pool. And we don't want to interfere with training time in the pool, which is um, higher priority. So we're often going in and asking for four straight days or more of uh, uninterrupted pool time. Um, and monopolization of the pool and hardware in the pool. So it's key that we start planning early on as possible with the uh, long-range planning people to say this is the, we need this amount of time to do this and we need these mock-ups in this special configuration to do it. They need to know ahead of time and they need to be able to tell us, well, we have training coming up and, or we have maintenance week and you know, that can't be interrupted, et cetera. So then, once all that's settled, Test Conductor starts weekly, uh, starts a kickoff um, with the MBL, with the crew office, operations, the PI, uh, everyone involved, and starts saying, what are our objectives? Uh, what, what's the background of this test? What are we really trying to achieve? Um, what's the schedule? Who our, uh, who our players are? And who needs to be included? And we do these weekly meetings weekly, pretty much through the whole two to four months to coordinate and develop these objectives. And there'll be things that change sometimes week to week as we get more, um, as we get more information about the hardware available to us, for example, or uh, as the hardware becomes more and more um, ready. And we'll get, uh, we'll get a status on that, of course, each week. We'll get pool configuration laid out more in detail as the time goes on and as that happens, which takes the two to four months before tests. As that happens, then the test conductor starts writing the test plan, um, writing the uh, hazard analysis or making sure it's written and ready, um, uh, writing the test procedures with inputs from people on the team, operations, even at a crew office. Uh, there will be, sometimes we'll start with detailed test procedures or, or um, mocked procedures from, say, the concept of operations or operations group. But we really just want a, a minor piece of that test. So we'll remove all the uh, excess. Uh, maybe, maybe we don't need to know torques, or maybe we don't need to know exactly where the tool is being stowed. Because in, testing, in development testing, we're more concerned about the specific task. A diver will hold the tool for us, for example. So we'll simplify a lot of times. Um, we will uh, sometimes, we'll have to look at um, whether it's going to be a two member or two crew member task or one crew member task. A lot of times we'll lay out the order of the test based on uh, what the priorities of the tests are, um, whether hardware is going to be needed by uh, another group going through testing or training on a certain day or time. Uh, we'll look at um, uh, if, if, say, two crew members need to work on this task, but the next task is only needing one crew member, 
maybe we can save time by doubling up on tasks. Uh, quite often we'll have more objectives than we have in the, uh, in the six hours, that, than we can accomplish in the six hours. So we'll double up on things. And, and we'll make sure that a crew member that doesn't accomplish a task or doesn't work a task has enough view to see what is done by the other crew member to be able to comment on it later on. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So the flight lead job is also huge and key, communicating the objectives to uh, and the pool setup requirements to the MBL team, um, the dive operations team, and sets up the preliminary configuration meeting, which is something that happens uh, one to two months before the test where we sit with the operations team at the MBL and say, these are the tasks we're going to do. This is the hardware we need. Um, this is any reconfiguration we might need from your team during the test that you need to be aware of so that you plan accordingly, um, assign the people that know what, uh, that know maybe are more familiar with the hardware um, and could work it better. Um, you know, this is what you need to account for in terms of pool setup and maybe identify any safety issues or potential life hazards that we'll have to uh, take into account during the test. Because as, as I mentioned, our, a lot of our configurations are special and unique. And sometimes we'll um, kind of walk that fine line um, with using hardware in perhaps slightly unusual ways, but to represent something that we're trying to accomplish. And for that, NBL will go through um, the process to assure that that special crest is safe um, and can be achieved safely and, and if necessary, documented as a, a live hazard so that divers and subjects are aware of it during the test. Um, then the crew office, of course, arranges the crew support for the test. Um, and, the, and then, like I mentioned, the flight lead and the test conductor determine if new hardware is needed. Um, and then as we get closer, a uh, few weeks before the test, Test conductor starts putting together mountains of paperwork, the briefing package for the crew, the TRR package for the hardware or the operations, um, if necessary, the pre-dive forms, submitting in the calendar what exactly the pool configuration needs to be down to every detail, and in the order of objectives, the camera requirements, the arm requirements, if any, uh, the tool requests are submitted to at this time so that USA can start pulling tools out. Um, this is put together based on the objectives and the procedures that the team has all worked on together that two to four months prior. And then, of course, um, the test conductor conducts the briefings and the scuba run and the suited runs, at times with um, contribution from the team members. Um, hardware experts will come in and be able to explain something way better than I can. So that sometimes occurs. Uh, crew office will sometimes have specific tasks they want to run, um, operations may, uh, it just depends. Uh, the flight lead course writes configuration checklists for the divers, step-by-step -step checklist to, uh, based on the pre-dive forms and get the dive team in, sets it all up, and all that in the few days before testing. So then, the day of, what do we do in the morning? We get there very early, the crack of dawn with the astronauts, and uh, run them through their objectives really quickly again and um, give them a last minute familiarization of uh, the hardware and the pool setup and, and their tools. And we help them you know, if, they, if they have questions about what tools they need, where they need to put tools, if they need them on their mini workstations or not, if they just throw them in the basket and the divers will get them or not, et cetera. Um, then, of course, the suit donning and doffing process. We just sit back and watch the test director and the MBL team do that, and then conduct the test. After the test director says go, then we have six hours to run it, or we have until 3 p.m., whichever comes first, and the objectives, uh, or, or if the objectives are complete before then, then we stop too. Um, then the suits are doffed, and we have post-dive debriefing with the, with the subjects, which takes typically an hour. Sometimes hardware providers will be there with the hardware, um, or with flight versions of the hardware to discuss comments. Um, sometimes hardware providers will get their comments and go straight into redesigning their hardware or they'll wait for the test reports to come later and do their redesigns or whatever. Uh, then of course working the console. That's a, that's a real-time 
ball game. <laughs> there are, um, of course, we have desired objectives. We have to ensure that we meet. But a lot of times we'll have unforeseen circumstances. Um, sometimes we'll get results that we didn't that we didn't anticipate, and we'll have to uh, reprioritize our testing. Or pool use conflicts will come up. Other suddenly some some other test going on needs something, um, or there'll be a delayed start due to a um, due to a a suit issue or a mock-up issue, things just come up. Um, meanwhile, we're always trying to do as much as we can, get as much of those objectives completed in the six hours, however way we can and safely and with, and, and of course maximize crew time, not have too much sitting there idle time. Um, which nobody wants that unless they're tired. And we'll give preemptive direction to divers. We'll say, okay, in five minutes I know I need this piece of hardware set up. So we start telling divers ahead of time while we're giving direction to the crew to set up this hardware, get it ready, or f swim it over to wherever. Um, and then, of course, if there are, if we're using the arm, there are other added protocols for that, communicating with the arm operator in addition to that. And then afterwards, I mean, during the test, of course, this is the type of data we collect. It's uh, whether a task can be accomplished, how many how many crew members worked on it, how many hands, what tools were used, what the foot restraint settings were, um, what the body positions exactly were, um, any changes to the procedures, and, uh, and any crew comments that they can provide actually during the test while they're in the suit, which amazingly enough, they're sometimes very good. Um, then uh, we add that on to everything that they give us in the debrief. Um, and then audio and video is recorded, of course. We'll always have a diver take still photos. Uh, for example, if we wanted to know that this bolt can be accessed with a PGT, or if it not, with a smaller tool, we'll make sure we get a picture of the crew member in the suit doing that so that it can be, so that it, it's documented later, it's put in a test report, it's proven, it closes a requirement, whatever. And the two um, methods for recording this is the EDVT report, which the test conductor writes, and the crew consensus report, which the crew office writes. It would be Zay Nye or Oscar Kaler, for example. Um, the uh, test reports include the quick look. Everyone probably knows what a quick look is. It comes out three days after and um, just covers what we, basically what we accomplished, if there are any safety issues, and maybe some basic photos. Um, we cover uh, the test report, comes out several weeks later, all the details, objectives, um, results, pictures of every task, um, the procedures as they turned out, <coughs> and the crew consensus report. And then the crew consensus report comes out rating all the objectives one by one with their acceptability um, and the, uh, the hardware for acceptability. And that is what is used later for actual requirements verification. This table here is the the EVA hardware and task ratings that the crew office uses for their consensus reports. And a lot of the stuff is in the paper that I mentioned too. If people want to look at it more later. So I won't go through it, but it just says a task is acceptable or unacceptable with some details, or we don't have an idea, it's inconclusive, we have to retest, for example. Um, how much time? OK, well, there won't be many questions, right? Uh, I have what? Okay. So, how much time do you want? Combine. <laughs> I should have made it for an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, one of the points that I want, we wanted to make, and and this is talked about extensively in the paper, is the the usefulness of MVL development testing and maybe some ways that it could have been used differently. And, and um, one of the examples is we had a, I shouldn't say we, but people had a great, this was before my time, so uh, we, there was great success with the Hubble servicing. Um, there were tasks that people didn't think were originally possible through EVA. There were, the, the, the Hubble was not designed, a lot of it was not designed to be serviced and Yet, with all this vetting in, in the MBL, um, with developing specialized new tools and evaluating them in, BL, in the MBL, lots, I mean, great success was achieved with servicing the Hubble, fixing it. That's one great example. 
Um, an example of maybe where it could have been used more, but this is all based on many factors, is in the development of the CETA carts. Uh, great testing went on, part test testing of the CETA carts. There, um, there was, however, not an, uh, not an opportunity for many reasons, uh, so certain operational uh, uh, certain operational paradigms were not available yet. Some information was not available yet. So we couldn't look at an evaluation of the integrated task, the whole door-to-door -door, um, seat of cart set up and use and then moving and then reset up. So had this been done, maybe, there might have been some inefficiencies that would have been identified and maybe in the, cancel the project would have been canceled and saved money because if you ask an astronaut now, that they don't really use them out there. They find other ways that are easier and save time and save money and less overhead. And they're really more in the way. They, more, they have to get moved out of the way to do other things more than anything. And so that's some of the challenges that there have been. Now, um, I really wanted to share this. But there's, a, there's constellation related testing that went on in the MBL for um, looking at uh, the Orion and 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 um, opening and closing the hatch and getting in and out of the hatch and um, you know what the potential setup and challenges would be with having an umbilical involved in the picture an umbilical to Orion or an umbilical to Altair the lander um, or any other vehicle dock with Orion all all this um, they looked at placing handrails on Orion on orbit as while translating to Altair or from Altair. Fun stuff. It's too bad we, are, we don't have that program anymore. Um, Near-Earth asteroid exploration has been looked at. Um, that shuttle tile repair wall that was built was repurposed for a very, um, very interesting task. Here was little rocks were put on the wall with Velcro, and, and in order to simulate, say, a station-keeping vehicle, uh, with a robotic arm on it, some vehicle that would be floating along the asteroid, asteroid and would have a, a person on the end of the arm trying to collect geologic samples or asteroidologic samples. Uh, uh, the idea is, say, you, the asteroid would be spinning at some who knows rate. So to re represent that, we had the crew member, we had the, the arm basically moving along at a very slow speed. We, we tried several speeds, um, and we had the crew members pulling rocks off of the wall or grabbing them with um, little off-the-shelf kind of tools for sampling that we brought in and also looked at an existing tool, the ISS EVA wipe and an empty gloved hand for just to see how is this possible, how fast can we go, things like that. Now I'll turn it over to Robert for future uses and external customers. Um, hello, everyone. Um, just wanted to give you a quick uh, background on what we're doing commercialization at the MBL. Um, like Juniper had mentioned, the uh, uh, MBL was built to assemble the International Space Station. That's obviously behind us. We're now in a maintenance mode. And with the end of the shuttle program, the amount of EVAs we're doing has drastically gone down. Um, during our um, during the what we call the wave of EVAs, we were doing 300 events a year, and next year we're projected to about 150. We obviously knew that was coming, so we looked at what ways can we uh, use the facility to offset our cost to actually get money coming in, cost savings to the government to keep the facility open. It's a very expensive facility to operate, and so we looked at ways of offsetting our costs. So um, when we were looking at that, we knew it wasn't, uh, you know, our typical mode of operation is it's a, it's a very risky environment when you do a spacewalk. So we have a lot of controls in place that you make sure you do it right. However, if you bring in a commercial entity, they most likely don't need to go to that level. So what we did is looked at all the potential customers coming in and then reevaluated how we did our kind of our rules and regulations. We did a URR, a use readiness review. We brought a board together that was actually signed off by Coates that said uh, um, we will actually go and use commercial, federal, and state um, rules and regulations when we're dealing with these other commercial entities. So that will actually make us competitive in that kind of a market. And I guess competitive is not the right word. Actually, to be able to work in that market, because since we're the government, we don't compete. Um, we go into a market that currently doesn't have that um, that niche being taken care of, and that's the MBL because of its size is very size is very unique. So that's where we stepped in. So we did a URR. It was approved at the center level. Um, that allowed us to be able to do a lot more of the commercial activities that we're doing today. Um, 
some of the areas that we've, uh, um, we're starting to look into, obviously government to government is good. We've done some water survival training for people like at Ellington or the, the Coast Guard and stuff like that. That has been very successful. We've gone to academia. We've done some testing for them. Uh, um, they did a neutral body position to see the, the changes of a, a person when they're in the body due to the neutral um, environment that you're in. That was successful. And then also we were looking at uh, the private industry, like the petrochemical industry, and there's a lot of similarities in our facility that they can use. Plus, we're very close to the Gulf Coast where a lot of those uh, companies operate. So that, that has been very successful so far. So uh, um, we really kind of changed how we do operations. Um, it's starting to be successful. We really haven't really, we haven't focused on doing this until about two years ago. So we're still kind of in our infancy of doing this. Uh, um, so. Here lately, we've been successful and hope we continues to, to gain momentum to be able to offset our costs to keep the facility open for a long time. It's a, a unique uh, um, U.S. asset that we want to be able to, to have available, um, hopefully for the next U.S. program that comes in, but here for the short term for, uh, um, for the academia, for the other commercial entities and stuff like that. So. I think that hits everything we had for commercial. I'd, I, I know we're running really short on time, so I'll, I'll hang around for an extra 15, 20 minutes. So I know the commercialization is very um, new to the center and the agency. So if anybody has any specific questions that we don't get in the hour, um, I'll hang around. So. Yeah, I'll hang out too. Are there any questions? Uh, I guess I have a Robert slide too. He started it. Um, you know, uh, just saying how unique and special the, the NBL is and how valuable it's been to the space program and, um, and you know, specifically the shuttle, I, Hubble uh, programs. Uh, you know, there's, there's been comments from external customers that, that, I don't know if I want to say it or if you want to say it, but saying that, you know, there's no other place that they can do um, they, that has all the capabilities for them to be able to do system integration testing and timeline development for new technologies like quite in the way that the MBL has with um, just all those all those uh, all those capabilities available um, you know Hubble the cost of testing in the MBL uh, was a fraction of the cost of would have been uh, on orbit EVA development um, there's millions of dollars have been saved by the EVA testing and training and mentioned again the CETA carts you know we could have tested some more there that would have helped um, there's pre-Columbia testing that that went I mean post-Columbia testing that went on to save uh, save the shuttle basically uh, you know just prove that we can we can service it and you know had that not been possible maybe we wouldn't have been flying it again um, and there's a lot of life cycle cost savings that results by doing testing you know you you make sure your hardware is operational and meets requirements before you get too far into your design or your development. And, um, you, you know, we think that, we hope that future spacecraft designers and space hardware designers will see that and, you know, maybe come and use the MBL for things like that. And uh, I just wanted to thank a few people uh, that John couldn't be here, his car broke down, but <laughs> he's been, uh, and, and Drew Manning as well, have been in this program, I mean, with EDVT since time began, and, uh, and they were really valuable in, in helping me gather some of the information, the history about this team, and, and uh, what, the, what, what all testing's been done, and, and that perspective that I didn't have in my four years. Derek Rochelle and Mansour Falou used to be on the team. They were worksite analysis, and, and they, were, they were awesome. Uh, Brian Burry has been my um, SSDS scuba buddy for years now. <laughs> he's, he's my dive inspiration, <laughs> and he's becoming a really excellent test conductor. He's a natural. Um, Wayne McCandless helped write some of the, the paper, he's, and he had some great ideas for um, you know, future MBL uh, uses. Cinda Chellen, um, you know, for giving me this opportunity, um, and Matthew Wells and Blake Demez with will, will the graphic artists. And then I just put contact information for, information for myself, Robert Durkin and Angie Prince from the, from the MBL and from the MBL External Relations Office. So thank you guys.